by the end of the day tomorrow, the 24th July 2019. The applicants to file and serve their replies, if any, by the end of Thursday 25th, 2019. As he stated earlier, the matter to be heard on uh, that 1st of July 2019 at 9 a.m. if no settlement is reached. And the Mukuru Kwajenga residents are, are, are living in fear after the forceful evictions that are planned, are planned by the county government to take place any time from now. The residents feel that they, they, are, they, are, they are going to, to lose their properties and of course they are now counting losses, especially now that the, the county government has now embarked on a mission to refurbish the resident, the resident area. They have uh, said that uh, we are supposed to be uh, 20 meters away from the line. It's a high voltage line, it's 20 meters away from the line. So those people who are encroached on the line, they are supposed to also to move. The children within those schools, they were supposed to be taken within government schools that are within this area. But the schools were demolished and uh, there was nobody, there was no student who was taken care of. So we are saying this, when the government wants to come on the ground, let them come and talk to us. We want to be talked to. We have solutions. We are the people. We are the power. We are the solution. There is no way they will just come silently, they sneak, and they, then they, dis they disappear. The next time they will come with bulldozers. The bulldozers are not coming to solve the matter. Sheria mm. hiko, their pipeline, Na ile tulikuwa tumepeleka kotini na tukaambiwa tuwe na negotiation outside the negotiation watu wakaenda underground wakajificha barua tulijiandika wakajificha wakawa hataki kuongea na sisi walipojificha wakakaa wakaona ni jia rahisi sisi watu wa pipe watu wa Ruben kwa sababu ni structures tumejenga ni kama hatuishi kama binadamu wakakuja wakagonga kila kitu wakamaliza And to another sad story, and KD of Soja Benego uh, Kaliti who died after facing an, explo an improvised explosive device, has finally been ready right to rest in Kiunga Lamo. That's Soja Benego, the Mayan Kaliti joined the service on 1st September 2008. At the time of his death, he had served the Kenya Army with loyalty and dedication for 10 years, 10 months and 14 days. He distinguished himself as an industrial, brave and honest service member who was committed to his profession. The cruel hand of death has robbed his family, relatives, colleagues in the army and the Kenyan Defense Forces and the entire nation a loyal patriotic. And the former uh, Kenya Revenue Authority boss, John, John Jiraini, is among 11 candidates listed to take over the National Land Commission chairmanship position. The immediate former Kenya Revenue Authority Director General John Jiraini is among 11 candidates shortlisted for the position of chairperson of the National Land Commission. The fell vacant after Mohamed Sozuri's term ended in February after serving the commission for six years since 2013. An interview timetable for the position seen by the star shows Jiraini will be screened for the slot on July 29th. Jiraini is being shortlisted for the position just a month after exiting the tax agency where he served for a total of six years in two terms for three years each. The selection panel's chairperson Priscilla Nyokabi stated that the interviews for those shortlisted are set to commence on Monday next week. Reporting for GBS Morning Extra, Sharon Maloba. Uh, the Machakos uh, County County boss, uh, Dr. Alfred Mutua, has urged the Chief Justice David Maraga to set up special calls that will be dealing specifically with corruption cases.
It is therefore important to set up a system where cases are fast tracked and accused persons are assured of justice either way. Those who are innocent are acquitted and those found guilty convicted and public monies recovered. Kenyans are losing patience with corruption cases that seem never to end where suspects continue walking free on the streets and even organizing campaigns using the same suspected stolen public monies. I therefore urge the Chief Justice to consider having corruption cases heard on a daily continuous basis, including weekends, so that they are concluded within a period of three months or less from the date of taking plea. And now to energy sector, and Kenya has launched the Africa's biggest uh, wind energy plant in Turkana. The, the plant was launched uh, last week by the President Uru Kenyatta. And, and now the, this, this uh, new project is expected to uh, to cover 13% of the national energy production grid and reduce the energy costs. President Kenyatta launched the largest wind power plant of 310 megawatts to the national grid in northern Kenya, Turkana County. He said that the new power plant will stabilize power supply and reduce energy costs among Kenyans. Kenyatta also said that his administration is in the first step to ensure that every part of Kenya participates in development efforts. Indeed, it should be noted that without the wind power project, the fuel cost charge, FCC, would have been as high as 5 shillings and 75 cents per kilowatt hour in May of 2019 as compared to three shillings and 75 cents per kilowatt hour, the cost that was applied in that particular month. According to project developer, introduction of the weed power will save electricity consumers shillings 8.5 billion fuel cost charges in 10 months. <laughs> Latest data bill of statistics shows a steep rise from 32.92 million units of capacity a year earlier. The wind farm was connected to the grid on 24th September last year. This was after construction of 438 kilometer at 400 kilovolts transmission line from plant site in Malsabet to Suswa substation. Stan Minor, GBS TV. Oh, thank you so much, Stan Minor, for that exclusive report so that's all we have this morning for the news updates and of course uh, i hope you're now updated on what's, what's going on and of course uh, we are following up other big stories during the day so just keep it right here with gbs and remember to join our conversation hashtag gbs money extra that's on twitter facebook and on instagram and of course two double one double four is our sms line which is always open so you can send your comments i uh, will be sampling some of them uh, as you continue the discussion and of course now let's look at what uh, the papers as this morning and i'm um, Still with uh, Timothy Mondi. Uh, Timothy, good morning, Tana. Good morning, morning. And uh, let's start with the Daily Nation. The Daily Nation uh, is talking about the cabinet reshuffle, Uru's EDEC. Uh, uh, President Rukiyata is expected to quickly pick replacements for Treasury, either in acting or substantive capacity by the end of the week. Uh, in now, how he navigates the terrain of the factional politics within Jubilee is a tough call. This is after. Uh, the courts yesterday released the CS rotage but banned him uh, from accessing uh, his treasury office. So that means the the office, as you speak, is currently vacant. So the president will have a, uh, to to pick a replacement. And of course, uh, it's all uh, eyes on president to see whoever is going to pick or maybe op may opt to reshuffle the whole cabinet. And Timothy, now that uh, the president has been denied the calls to reshuffle the the cabinet. Uh, now, could this move now force him to reshuffle the whole cabinet? Uh, I'm not really sure about that, but then uh, what uh, the nation is actually looking to, or what the president is now faced with, is that definitely he has to replace uh, the cabinet secretary, Mr. Rotich. Definitely he has to do that. So, uh, and I think when you look at the nation, they've, uh, you know, kind of floated some of the names that uh, could possibly uh, be fit to replace Rotich, although we don't know clearly who, but he has to replace him. 
Okay. That's one thing for sure. <laughs> and as soon as possible, because the country cannot function without a... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I think according, to, according to the nation newspaper, when you read, you know, he has probably at least until the end of the week to, to do that. We don't really have much time. And uh, it's a critical moment where there, there are a lot of uh, government functions that, uh, especially deal, dealing with Treasury, that are supposed to take off and that are supposed to be carried out which, of course, Mr. Rotich was in charge of. And so a replacement is indeed in order. Okay. And uh, maybe you can sample some of the names that are, uh, are the daily nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw Mr. <laughs> Mukisa Kitui there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe it can be possible or maybe the president could have other options. Uh, but uh, the nation has just shot some of the best options for the president. Mm -hmm. as the head of uh, public service, uh, Joseph Kinyo. Mm -hmm. uh, was things that uh, treasury, has worked at Treasury and Central Bank earlier on. Yeah, Joseph Kinyo worked with the president. Remember, he was his uh, own uh, permanent secretary when he was at Treasury, when he, who himself was the Minister for Finance. Yeah. Joseph Kinyo was there working with him. And uh, someone like uh, the former, the former what? The former uh, Barclays, uh, what do we call him? Oh, the former Barclays boss. He's also a CS. Yeah, uh, but he's a uh, James Masharia mm -hmm. and R Ruth Kagia. Yeah, and of course uh, Esther Koymen, mm -hmm. and of course and uh, Adel Mohammed. Adel Mohammed. Adel yeah. Mohammed is also could also fit in the docket. But if you would ask me, I think Mukisa Kitui for that position. Possibly, I don't know about Unikta, but. Uh, I don't know if his term, I think his term will be ending this year, if I'm not wrong. But uh, when called up for national duty, I think it's incumbent of him that uh, he should actually oblige to, uh, not really, but uh, he's not mandated, but as uh, to show statesmanship and uh, uh, what we could call uh, uh, patriotism. It's possible for him to uh, and remember we also, job by the UN. And remember we also have a minister without a portfolio, uh, Rafael Tuju. <laughs> no, I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's the president's advisor and uh, he's a close political advisor, so probably he, he has a lot of work already. Uh, but maybe the president can also figure out replacing him somewhere else and then shifting cabinet secretary to that docket. Mm, not necessarily. <laughs> he can hold both dockets. Now, as you see, as you, I think it's written, uh, if you read the nation, he has to do it either on an interim or on a permanent basis. Okay. Yeah, so whoever he puts there could be on an interim basis. He could decide and give one of the CSs who are already there, like Aden, he could give him the, the position. Okay. Or Kinyua, he could give him still the position to hold at an interim position, you know, f at an interim, so that as he plans on how to permanently replace Rotich, you know, depending on how much work uh, the person can handle and how his plan is generally. Okay, there's also a question of um, uh, the, court, uh, the court ruling was very open. Uh, I just say that the, the CS cannot access mm -hmm. uh, the Treasury Towers yeah, yeah. Until, uh, until he has a DCI officers. And now uh, the question is, uh, when will this case end? And of course, maybe the Trotich will be challenging that, so it can be given maybe an ultimatum to know. Of course, maybe definitely he has to challenge this for about a year he or six months. Not, he pleaded not guilty. Yeah. And uh, of course, it's a matter that is before court, so I don't think it's really the platform for us to discuss the matter. But from what I know, and following the, the, the hearings uh, uh, the mentioned yesterday closely, it's it's one thing is clear that uh, definitely there is uh, some questions to be answered okay. uh, remember the day before yesterday when haji uh, presented his case he had a quite lengthy argument presented to the nation and he is sure of uh, his case and so he is sure that he has a case which of course you cannot dismiss okay and uh, i believe that uh, i hope that justice will take us. Of course, the, the news has made headlines around the world, and uh, you know, I, I was watching some international channel, and it's one of the big news globally today. You know, a, mini, a sitting cabinet minister put inside prison for corruption charges, uh, showing also 
pointing towards the direction that indeed uh, the president is willing to do everything. And like he said on the 4th of April when he was making the State of the Nation address, that in his cabinet, anyone who will be, you know, charged with corruption cases or with corruption charges must step aside and allow for investigations to take place. And kama vile alisema wakati ule mwingine, kila mtu abebe msalaba yake, usiibe kwa sababu unafikiria tuko pamoja hapana, tuko pamoja ukishikwa ukiiba wewe beba msalaba yako. Of course I'm not saying that uh, Mr. Ochich is guilty, but of course with respect to the constitution of Kenya that stipulates that you are innocent until proven guilty but then there is a case to answer and that is what is happening right now so as much as we cannot discuss the topic i believe that uh, indeed there's a question there's a case to answer in this okay and this is the first time it's happening actually it's the first time and first time uh, in kenya and of course in, in the whole east africa region not uh, not just <laughs> east africa region i think uh, in many countries around the world i'm talking about east, east, yeah yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. Is maybe the first time uh, sitting yeah. cabinet secretary is arranged to court. Sure. Um, and of course, he surrendered himself. He didn't want to embarrass himself. <laughs> of course, uh, yeah. The embarrassment of the arrest. Yeah, the authorities sometimes can be very <laughs> ruthless and, <laughs> and mannerless. So. And of course, he met Evans Kidero there, also also facing another graft case, which was a. Uh, yeah. yeah. Kidero has also been in and out of court, I think. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, as much as all this, it's not fun to have these you know key figures leaders in our society being arraigned in court every day left right and center but it is also important for kenyans to note that justice for the kenyans is pretty much something that uh, needs to be given <coughs> uh, uh, precedence and when you look at how much money the country is losing to corruption cases i think it's just appalling and uh, really Corruption cases should be handled with a lot of, uh, you know, strictness and seriousness in Kenya. And probably, let's see convictions, not just arraigned, being arraigned in court, released uh, with hefty bonds and, 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 and bills, and then the cases vanish. Things like the euro bond and stuff, I mean, almost like vanished. The golden bag vanished. We've had big scandals in the country just vanish. Okay. I hope that uh, we could finally see convictions. Okay, mm. and the Daily Nation is talking about the the rise and fall of the marbling money man. Uh, until April 2013, Mr. Rotich, uh, the marbling money man, was a, a little known economist operating behind the scenes in the president's Mwai Kibaki government. Uh, he was unlikely candidate for the top job at the National Treasury when the Jubilee government took power, but he had done enough uh, when he was in charge of the macroeconomics department in the Treasury to win the ad ad admiration of the president's Kenyatta. I would short, short sting uh, at, the, at the finance ministry. Of course, they are describing how Rotic uh, found himself in all this saga mm -hmm. from uh, when he was a, a, a little known economist mm -hmm. uh, in the treasury. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it's also a big story that uh, uh, everybody should read. And of course, you can grab your copy of the nation. Also talking about uh, Tahib's, uh, Tahib's uh, Aculin task against the big fish, a soft spoken straight shooting advocate who shies away from side shows. Mr. Taib Ali Taib is now the man expected to nail the country's top treasure officials facing uh, graft charges. This is uh, uh, the ODPP's uh, uh, advocate mm -hmm. uh, who is taking on this case. And uh, senators approve uh, 335 billion SMPs, uh, table another bill for less. Uh, this is the political row that's going on between the Senate and National Assembly. Uh, the circus surrounding the Division of Revenue Bill 2019 continued yesterday with the Senate debating and passing it, it, its own version of a, of a record 40 minutes. Uh, it settled on 335 billion as an equivalent shareable revenue for counties in 2019, uh, 2019 2020 financial year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also another story that... Uh, yeah, I saw a parliament, mean, I, uh, parliamentary calling it uh, a piece of paper, so I don't know uh, what all this... Yeah, still, it's a tug of war between the upper house and the lower house, of course, but uh, I, I applaud what uh, you know, Chief Justice Maraga did. You know, Maraga is actually telling them that, uh, hey, guys, look, this now you have to sit down and talk. You cannot solve this with, you know, through the court. And so Maraga has thrown this back to them, Okay. so that they can go uh, talk to each other 
and you know find an amicable solution you know the 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 parliament is very important both houses are very important because that's Tom, that's where we make our legislation and that's where issues are supposed to be debated issues are supposed to be debated votes are supposed of course to run but then it's the house where kenyans come to reason together and if these guys can just hold guns at each other's head and refuse to negotiate and agree then i think they're putting the country in a very dangerous uh, and, and vulnerable position but thankfully i think maraga chief justice maraga saw this and he his wisdom he has actually asked them to go back and you know talk uh, i saw the standard this morning say uh, maraga tells them you know this it this is a matter of talking it's not a matter of courts so yeah. they have to go they have to agree and of course it's a, it's a legislation process it is a legislation process so, so at so. this point there's no uh there's no substantive issue that the court should now chip in yeah i mean and uh, and also it's uh, interpretation i think what what we are lacking is a proper in interpretation of roles you know functions and roles of these two houses and uh, partly i would say a big mistake that we made uh, when you know looking at how the the the, the law itself was uh, was constructed uh, even after the promulgation of course during the promulgation there was also a lot of pressure for a change of law and all that you know remember the kibaki regime came into power with promises of giving us a new constitution and that's how it carried the day but then still much work needs to be done of course i do agree that a clear demarcation needs to be made so that the two houses can actually be separated so that we know okay. what's the upper house what's the lower house so that all these wrangles pass i mean if someone passes their own law another person wakes up in the morning and in 40 minutes record just passes a law that is very pertinent that touches on issues to do with serious public funds you know it's not it's not something that is really desirable to see okay. and it's a pity especially for uh, the voters because they expect services and now they uh, the task is all about sure. how much will be allocated sure. the county sure. companies sure. and now uh, uh, the standard is talking about the dramatic fall of rotich in just 24 hours uh, when CS woke up in his uh, palatio, palatio uh, coming home on Monday, he did not uh, envision himself spending a night in police cells, uh, sharing a mattress and a blanket with his uh, peers. Uh, uh, he's also talking about the fall of uh, CS Rotich. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, the fall per se, but the uh, expected fall <laughs> of uh, CS Rotich. talking about uh, how he did not expect that this week would be, would be such dramatic and painful to him. And now, uh, and now they, they were released yesterday, uh, that's on page three, the standard, uh, the page uh, five, sorry. Uh, Steve, uh, 50 million bail for key suspects in dams and rotate job uh, as treasury cabinet angst in the balance after uh, the anti-corruption court slapped him with a tough bail condition yesterday in addition to depositing 15 million cash bill uh, to secure his release after being charged with conspiracy to defraud the government 63 billion. Uh, Chief Magistrate Douglas Ogoti stated that uh, Caesar teach must not go near his office unless accompanied by a uh, police officer, which actually puts his job at risk. And then the president will be forced, uh, as we had discussed earlier, would be forced to uh, to maybe appoint uh, yeah, a replacement uh, for him, uh, replacing me in the in the treasury docket. Yeah. And to talk about page seven, the standard is talking about the Senate refers Garissa probe to ESCC office. Senate has recommended that Ethics and Anti Corruption Commission. Opens an investigation into suspected uh, procurement malpractices in Garissa County. A Senate County Public, Ac uh, County Public Accounts and Investment Committee chaired by Moses Kajong. Uh, the Mabi Senator said there was a breach of Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Act, nearly every procurement done by the county. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, private uh, universities in the new curriculum in score high voltage new student voting plan. Uh, so about the democratic uh, obligations by the education system, a private university stop the list of uh, national institutions of higher learning to have fully implemented the new student's election model uh, that replaced the popular vote. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can comment on this as you wind up. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, do you support the, the, this, uh, the voting system that was introduced uh, that uh, students will be electing representatives representative to elect their leaders? 
Uh, you know, I think I said this one time when we, we were in this show. Uh, Kenyans, Kenyans are very, how can I say, <laughs> creative people. <laughs> and uh, it, through such systems, you see the need or the urge for Kenyans to have more transparent, more organized and hierarchical uh, uh, ways of doing the things. And I think uh, it's, it's more or less what some politicians are trying to, you know, vouch for in terms of elections. Because right now we are talking, of, when you look at the Punguza Mzigo initiative that was published the other day by the Okuro team, you realize that there are proposals actually to allow for election of a college that can actually in return elect some top leader, leadership of the country. And you realize that such, sometimes such systems work, especially when the systems that be are so mad with you know, corruption and violence and uncertainty and lack of trust. You know, lack of trust is also something that, uh, because sometimes someone is elected and everybody is like, ah, uh, yeah. but then if they do it in such, a, you know, in such a manner, then let the students elect their leaders and let the leaders elect now the top leadership. I, I, to me, I think it's fair enough. It's also a system that, uh, of course, works in many other countries okay. at uh, very high political levels. And so, I don't know, but I think it's something that can be tried. If it can work for students, then probably <laughs> maybe in future we can uh, say, uh, why not try uh, it out uh, for the nation? Uh, in my opinion, I don't think it can work in Africa. Uh, why not? Considering the volatility, <laughs> volatility of, our, of our politics in, in Africa. Yeah, I, I mean, Tom, if we can't trust the mass voting, Africa, how would Africa, you trust the few to elect one for leaders? Not really trust, not really, it's not a, really a matter of trust, but then it's a matter of looking at the systems okay. and how the systems are placed. And if this, you know, elections should be made as easy as possible. Okay. In some developed countries, Tom, elections are, people cast their votes in the morning and by the next morning they know the, the leader. There's no, you know, kelelemingi and stuff. But then, because the systems that they have in place allow for a smooth carrying out of the whole process. But so, in Africa, we all talk about a compromised system. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm telling maybe you. Maybe in the future, but now I don't think it can work. I mean, I mean yeah, of course, everything has <laughs> its time and everything needs to be gradual. Okay. But then also, as voters, we also need to change uh, our set of thinking. Our school of thinking should not just be fixed that we are a corrupt nation okay. and that nothing can work or this or that. But then what I'm trying to look at is if we start thinking progressively in such ways, then we have, you know, lawyers who are educated enough, who understand the law and who can also advise okay. the way forward on, on such systems. So I don't see the harm. I think it's something worth trying. Why okay. not? Mm. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Timothy Mondi. Uh, we are now going to take a quick breather. We we'll see you in the other side of the break. But keep tweeting hashtag GBS Money Extra two double one double four. Uh, it's our SMS line. I'll be reading some of your comments as we come back after this short break.
IYF is changed. IYF is cold. And their woman, she's a very, very good investment. When you're up, your family knows who you are. But when you're down, you'll figure out who your family is. Thank you so much. In March 2018, the CLF World Conference was held in New York. There were 1,000 Christian leaders from 35 countries many of whom were recommended and invited by their fellow ministers in their own countries. It showed that CLF was an essential program for more and more leaders and that it had become a turning point. The youth, we need to change the way we approach issues. That this, the world out here is very harsh. I was just waiting for things to happen in life, like finish school, then just go to career life. Some people are depressed. You're not depressed because you are, you know, you have a problem. Some people are depressed because they're frustrated. So we young people, in as much as we claim that we are denied opportunities of leadership, I think we also have to assert ourselves as leaders. And the one challenge that I keep telling the young people, it is the mindset. Our mind education is so important in many different ways. When you go to the world, they don't ask you, are you Kekoyo or are you Luya? Hey, I'm Luya, but I'm going to make a joke, I'm going to make a Everywhere, GBS. Right! Ninani! Ninani! Carry on! Hola! Genius DJ! Genius DJ! Genius DJ! Genius hype man! Wow! It's bigger, it's better, it's live. I'll be your host, I follow the experience. Genius Republic DJ Karian. Join us for Ekom Ziki each and every Sunday from 8 a.m. For the best in gospel music as we host your favorite gospel ministers. Every Sunday, live on your favorite station, GBS TV. Everywhere, GBS. Oh, thank you so much for keeping it GBS uh, Morning Extra. This is a very wonderful morning. Uh, and also thank you so much for your comments. I'm seeing a lot of comments coming up right here. Uh, let me sample some of them before we continue. I have Maureen Ngatia saying I'm locked uh, from Ruiru. Uh, of course, uh, Deborah Nyamu Kitengela saying I'm Hamhin. Uh, Masi Kinudi Hamhin, Edna, Edna Nyaboki Hamhin. And of course, Sylvester uh, Kivu saying uh, I'm also locked in. And thank you so much for the updates. 
Sandi sana pia karibu uh, GBS Morning Extra. Uh, we also have Kevin Muturi uh, from Bungoma saying, uh, uh, although I see the arrest of uh, CS Rotich as a PR exercise, let's support the fight against corruption. A very interesting comment there. And of course, uh, keep them coming. Uh, 211 is our SMS line, hashtag GBS Morning Extra is our hashtag, both on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And now we shift gears to talk about uh, something that is going to happen uh, at Kasarani Stadium on 28th uh, this month to 1st August. That's the uh, C11 and IYF uh, youth camp that's going to take place uh, at Kasarani. It's all about youths and uh, this nation as a lot. Youths are going through a lot, especially issues of unemployment, unemployment sorry, issues of uh, corruption also affecting youths. Uh, the politics of this country also affecting the youths. But do do you really as a youth understand how to deal with all these issues and that's why this cup now come chips in to come and brainstorm and get lectures and advices from uh the relevant people who are supposed to to guide you and, and also show you the way as a youth and of course how to maneuver all these uh, economic trying times and timothy mondi uh asante sana uh for joining us and um uh we have seen the youths go through a lot yes. in this country, mm -hmm. as I have mentioned. And now that uh, you have been a beneficiary of this program, sure. Uh, and now here you are. Uh, now, roughly, can you tell us the idea of IYF, and of course, uh, how it will help in tackling all these issues? Uh, I think a, 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 an organization like IYF is uh, one that. Uh, is timely, first I would say, timely and really working uh, for the benefit of the youth. In this way, I will say, Tom. Uh, today, when you look at today's uh, society, everybody is very busy. And, you know, there's a lot of information going around and there are, you know, there's a lot of problems that are facing society and people's minds are so occupied with a lot of things that are happening around them economic issues, political issues like the ones we are talking about, you know. And people tend to forget about the younger generation. And then once we forget about the younger generation, what we forget is that when these children, the younger generation I'm talking about, the small children, when they grow up, they grow up in some, in some kind of a vacuum where there's no one really to give deep thought or to, give, to think deeply about what they are going through and how they are growing up. So in that transitional stage of you know, teenagers where they are now growing into young adults and then finally adults, you realize that parents and children are becoming more and more apart. Today, Tom, and it's really a pity to say this, that most parents hardly see their children or hardly sit with their children. Probably maybe on Sunday when they are going to church, but even on Sunday when they are going to church, they will go to church, yes, sit together there, or the children will go for Sunday school, or sometimes some people prefer not to go to church or just go to some, you know, fun place and ha allow the children to have fun, yes, but then you'll find parents sitting here, children playing there, and the time that parents spend with their children is becoming l less and less. Then... What does that mean? That means that the society is detached. Who spends most of the time with our children? It's the households who are looking after our children. Parents are busy looking for money. Of course, the cost of living has gone so high. Uh, you know, the poor and even the rich, everybody is crying. But then when you look at this, then you ask yourself, what is happening to our society? And that's why it is really important for, for us to bridge that gap you know, between the young people and the challenges that they are facing. What personally I experienced at IYF is that when I was a juvenile, <laughs> I was about 19 years old, a rudy boy there, that's when I met with IYF. And when I met with IYF, I was at that point where I had to make some decisions in life. I was not going into adulthood, but then the decisions that I was about to make I had no one to actually advise and tell me, you should do this or you should do that. Uh, I remember by that time I had, you know, moved in with my elder brother 
and we were living apart from our parents. Our parents were living in the rural areas. And, you know, you're just there and you're alone. You know, yes, your elder brother can only give you so much in terms of advice. But then you also need to think about what is my future? How do I engage with people? How do I blend into the larger society? So such transition, such a transition is so important for young people. And that's why you realize that people's characters are actually defined by how they are able to handle the transition. From that teenage stage into the young adulthood, that's, that stage is very important. And that's why in the IIF, there is this program that I know of. They call it the Form 4 Leavers Program. You know, what they do with the Form 4 Leavers is between the period where the kids leave high school, as they are waiting to join either college or university, they have some kind of a training program. Okay. And that training program actually allows them to get mentorship, allow them to go through uh, several trainings, you know, basic things like that of different you know, foreign languages, that of things like computer. They are introduced into, you know, they're given time to practice arts like dance and acting and music and so on and so forth. So you find for about eight months, these kids are actually put there and they're engaged. They're never idle. Okay. And it's a, posi it's, it's a transition that, uh, personally to me, it worked because when I saw how I was able to go through that transition, I, I remember I went through a six-month training, and then after the six-month training, I was more than glad to extend my training to about a year and a half. Finally, I did about three years of like full-time volunteer work in the IYF, and I was able to travel the country, I was able to meet people, I was able to be given many responsibilities because sometimes when we go to other areas to work with young people, then we realize that we are given responsibility that, okay, Timothy, you are in charge of costume. Okay. Or Timothy, you are in charge of arranging for the program. Okay. Who has ever taught me? No one has ever taught me, but I've seen what has been done, and now I have to take up the challenge. Okay. And when you take up the challenge, I, I promise you, Tom, at that young age when young people are taught about critical thinking, what many young people lack is critical thinking. Okay. And the issue of... Uh self-realization mm -hmm. it has been the the major challenge that the youth are facing mm -hmm. because most probably after they they, they finish that's the education system mm -hmm. either that's the 844 mm -hmm. then they're now released to the market mm -hmm. and they they when they get out there they get shocked this is what not they were prepared for this was not what they have been learning from uh when they began the education to this level now there's a they know some of them find themselves in a lot of confusion and even uh some decide to take very uh, desperate measures to cope up with life. Mm -hmm. And I believe that IYF is also training people through this, through the mind education. Yes. Now, uh, how does mind education work towards addressing all these issues? And why specifically should a youth out there attend this camp? Uh, two major reasons. First, it's a very good place for networking. I will tell you. The IIF Youth Culture Camp, it's a mind-blowing experience. You attend one, those are memories that will never fade off your, your head. I mean, you remember that for the rest of your life. I remember when we were starting and when we were arranging, I've seen so many people go through this. <laughs> I don't know if I should say this, but if he's watching, the Honorable uh, nominated seminar, uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Moora. <laughs> Moora was actually my student when he was a student at Kenyatta University. And we had a really good time with him, and he always remembers that. It's an experience that he always, whenever we meet or whenever we find an opportunity to talk, he always has to remind me about that. And it's a networking, it's a place where you do networking and you meet with so many people and you come to experience so much such that within a short, very short period of time, it's, the camp normally lasts because people come there and board. The camp normally lasts for uh, about four days, four days, four nights and five days to be more precise. And that networking experience, that's mind blowing. Okay. But then the other thing is this, you know, mind education or this camp when we engage young people 
in this mind education. What we, are to, what we are doing is we are exposing them to explore the world of the heart. And what do we mean by the world of the heart? The world of the heart basically is now what you're to, we're talking about, self-realization. Who is Tom? You know, whenever we want to build a house, you're talking about a blueprint. So mind education is actually what allows you to study your blueprint, the blueprint of your mind, the blueprint of your heart. Who is Tom? You know, where is his weak points, his strengths, what needs to be changed, what needs to be strengthened more, and so on and so forth. So mind education to these young people is really pertinent because, as I mentioned, this is a transitional period where many young people uh, just got into campus or about, are about to get into campus. And that age group, what normally happens at that age group is that they're really not sure about what's happening. And so when they engage or when they meet some new staff, some of them suffer from culture shock because straight from high school you go to campus and then you realize, oh, you know, everybody is having a good time and people, you're like, when do they read? And if you're not careful, if you don't choose the right company, then you realize that you find yourself somewhere two years down the line and you realize that half of your life in university is wasted and you don't know how to go about it. So self-realization through mind education, we really allow young people to know who is Timothy and what is the right way to go. Okay. And basically that really helps. And it may sound like something very small, but it also uh, uh, refers to something that I read in one of the dailies. They're talking about about 10 million Kenyans today suffer from different sets of mental illness. You know, mental health to Kenya is, has never been taken seriously. And I can say that with a lot of uh, surety and, um, you know, with, without uh, uh, a shadow of doubt. Because, Tom, many people, when you talk about mental health, people just think of Madare Hospital. That's not all what mental health is all about. It is a state of being conscious and being cautious as well in okay. terms of the decisions that you make and the approaches that you take to life. Are you stable enough to make that decision? Are you conscious of your, your surrounding, of your environment, as you live with people? That's a very important state of mind where if we are able to train these young people how to use that, then we're actually able to reduce cases of mental health in Kenya. And I believe that through mind education, uh, many young people can find, uh, you know, uh, solace for their life and they can be able to see a brighter future. Okay. Mm. And uh, many people out there maybe uh, might, uh, might be asking, this uh, IYF, mm -hmm. now that you have highlighted some of the beneficiaries, mm -hmm. uh, Senator, nominated Senator mm -hmm. Isaac Maura, mm -hmm. and of course uh, you are here, an evident, sure. an evidence uh, that is, uh, uh, I would say um, now, is mind education all about training the youths? And, um, or is there anything else that you gain from it? Apart from just uh, uh, the lectures, the advices, what else uh, uh, will people gain from that? Uh, Tom, when you are in your right state of mind, you know, they, they say, as a man thinketh, so is he. Then what does that mean? And I'll quote, you know, there's a, there's a saying that says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flows all the issues of life. Issues of marriage, issues of education, issues of business, issues of how you relate with the society. All these things emanate from your heart. All these things emanate from inside you. And then if your heart is arranged, if your state of mind if your mindset is correct, right, yeah. and well-placed, then we couldn't have issues of corruption in our society. We couldn't have the senseless killings that we see. We couldn't have issues of drug abuse. We couldn't have issues of divorce. You know, husband and wife would probably know, okay, from a young age they've been taught problems can be solved, you know, issues can be ironed out through dialogue and so on and so forth. So, 
cases of divorce right now are on the rise. Why? Because nowadays in our society, you know, ah, he cheated on me or she cheated on me. She's a liar. He's a liar. I'm quitting. I, I'm taking a break from this. I mean, how do you take a break from marriage? I don't really understand how that works. But then it is the, the, the mindset that people have conceived towards approaching life that is making us to see what we are having in society today. Our societal fabric has worn out. Why? Because many people, in their mind actually, it's not clear what they want and you know the kind of life that they want to live. And that's why, hence, the outcome that we see today. Okay. And uh, Kenya, we don't have a clear definition of uh, youths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> As on a lighter note, uh -huh. we don't have a clear definition of youths. Yeah, people in 50 is calling themselves. Well, the Inga is a youth. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, why I'm, <laughs> that's why I'm saying there's no clear cut. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, this camp, mm -hmm. uh, can an, an elderly person attend it? Or anyone who just perceives himself as a youth can attend it? Or is there any age limit that Maybe the organizers have limited to maybe from this age to this age. It is an it is an event that is targeting youth. But Tom, at a level, we are also inviting vice chancellors. We have vice chancellors from other universities who will be coming. We have dean of students from other universities who will be coming to the same event. We have uh, we are engaging uh, people in the education sector. Okay. We are uh, engaging people in the respective youth ministries. We've got the Ministry of Youth. Uh, in in the in the in the in the county level we've got also the ministry that uh, uh, handles issues of youth on the national level so we have ministry of, ministries of youth from different counties actually as i'm speaking to you today are organizing their youth to send them to nairobi for that event okay ministries of youth are sponsoring buses and registration fee for these young people and sending them to nairobi to participate so it is also a platform where we are calling stakeholders in the education and the youth sector to come on board and also sit down, discuss, and kind of come up with ways of how to guide these young people and how to work out guidance for the youth of this country. So it's not just about youth, but as we mentioned uh, on, uh, on the sidelines, we'll also be having another major event running concurrently with the IYF Youth Culture Camp, mm -hmm. that is the CLF. Of course, I think we've had representatives of CLF come here and speak about it. It's a meeting also for church leaders, uh, that's deacons, evangelists, pastors, bishops, archbishops, and so on and so forth. They also handle youth in their own ministry, on, in their own respect, and wow. their space of work. So it's also, it's also another platform that we are using also to champion for guidance for the young people. So no, it's not just for youth even elderly people who are keenly working in terms of guidance and leadership for young people are also invited to the event to come and see some of the skills they can apply, to come and learn uh, some of the ways that they can use to mitigate problems that uh, face youth in our society today. Okay. So it's an open forum? It's an open forum. Okay. Uh, maybe you know, there are youth in the Changanya Twinkie, <laughs> especially in our setup. <laughs> And uh, of course, the charges. It's a uh, generation. Of course. Uh, can you talk about the charges and of course uh, what it all catered for as we finish? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like we've seen continuously, uh, charges are only a thousand bob. Okay. Someone may want to ask themselves why so cheap. It's not actually cheap. To host one person for those many days, they're provided with a certificate, they're provided with a t shirt, they're provided with transport, they're provided with three meals a day, they're provided with the accommodation. And of course, they will take a shower okay. for their sanitation. And all these, these are bills. Someone has, must foot these bills. And that's why uh, this cost is actually subsidized because our reasoning as we organize for this is that these are young people. And when you stiffen so much the charges for such events, then youth tend to shy away. We are talking about a bigger percentage of our society okay. being youth most of them unemployed so again if we again start uh, making the prices high for them what does that mean and that's why we are working very closely with corporate organizations like i mentioned with government institutions both in the county and the national level so that we can just subsidize the cost in terms of registration 
to allow these youth to come and benefit from this very nice initiative that we prepared for them. Okay, and it starts on Sunday? Yeah, it's starting on the 28th. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming through. Thank you. Because waking thank up you, this early, yeah. uh, Naibarid is not easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Of course, thank you, thank you so much for keeping it GBS Money Extra, and of course for your comments and for your for your company always. And we, it's a pleasure, and I, I would say thank you again for your for your company, and of course for keeping it GBS, and of course uh, for your comments and uh, your support. That is, and uh, now today uh, I wish you a good day. My name is Tom Moema. See you tomorrow.